Um, my name is Tim Witcher. Um, I work for a company called WSP. What I do is I'm the head of Future Ready Rail. Future Ready Rail is a global initiative from WSP to address a number of what we call mega trends. So this is things like sustainability and climate change, but we're also talking about what we're doing with people. We've got demographic changes coming up. We've got changes in age. We've got changes in uh, population size, density. We've got various population uh, constraints that we've got to try and deal with. We've got issues like poverty, which we've still got to alleviate. There's loneliness. It's starting to become a problem now. We've now got people where we, we've got worlds that are now starting to isolate people in a lot more, uh, a lot more aggressively than they would have done previously. We've got that kind of, we've got a kind of way of, of trying to pull it all together and see what we can do about that. Future Ready is our broader initiative. I'm the guy for the rail side. So for me, it's all about what do we do to improve railways and transport. I do more than just rail. I do other transport systems as well, but not maritime. I'm not allowed near the maritime bit for whatever reason. So, start quite grandly, because nothing in rail happens overnight, so you've got to be prepared to really dream. What can we do if we can actually, we could radically overhaul the way we do transport in the UK. In fact, we could do it anywhere, but what if we could really overhaul the way we, the way we move things around, the way we, the way we affect people's lives? And it's, it's more than just, it's more than just moving stuff. It, transport gives people freedom. That ability to move people, to go out and do stuff, to, to take people who are living at home, sitting at home on their own and isolated and actually saying, actually, no, you know, we can, we can find ways of getting you out and about, we can alleviate things like loneliness and all that kind of stuff as well. So, but there's a, there's a, bit, of a bit of a journey for us, if you excuse the pun. It's quite a big challenge trying to deal with this. So we start with quite a simple bit of, uh, of RCA. So what are all these things? What are people... What is the, the issues with loneliness, the demographics, the sustainability? What does it all have in common? Well, the first thing it has in common is it all costs money. Money is the only way we're going to fix it. Funnily enough, we don't have an awful lot of that at the moment. Regardless of what, ignoring what the politicians might tell you, it does not grow on trees. It has to be generated somewhere. Generation requires people to go out and make money, which generally means industry. Industry means creating cities is about supply and demand. And generally speaking, it means you've got to move stuff from A to B because those two things generally don't sit in the same location. Contrary to popular belief, these things have to all come together. And moving goods and people and services, it's all part and parcel of that. So we've got this, we've got this, we've got a, a vague idea, but what that basically means is transport is kind of the, it's kind of the, it's kind of the key issue. If we can unlock the transport, we can start to generate better industry. We can generate better industry, get more money, and we can start to fix bigger problems. And something, uh, I think it's something like 97, 98% of, of all businesses in the UK are actually small businesses, less than 20 people. So 98% of the people, 98% of the business out there is sitting on the back of this transport network. So just to put that in a bit of context, we see, you see transport strategies, you see policies, and there's the DFT, and there's network rail, and all this other stuff going on. But actually what that really means is that in real terms, most of this stuff is about grassroots. It's about ordinary people doing whatever it is they do. And most of them don't care about the policy and the DFT and all that kind of rubbish. It's about ordinary people getting the job done. So we've got to make it work for those people. And we're in quite a lucky position because we have huge amounts of technology. What we don't have is it all joined up together. As we've seen with energy and we've seen other people's conversations today, <coughs> the technology exists, it just doesn't we haven't done anything to fit it together. Most people don't see it. Uh, we talked about, I think there was uh, in our last conversation, we talked about legacy, and about legacy systems, about the legacy infrastructure for power. I guarantee you it is worse in rail. We have railway out there that is over 100 years old. We have railway that is over 150 years old. We have 28% of the line, by line length, right, by mileage, is a guy in a box pulling levers. Still today, 28% is a guy that pulls a lever. Never updated it. It's just it's cheaper. It's cheaper to get, pay somebody to sit there for half a day and pull levers for us. Thirty percent of the line is relays, right? If you don't, if you're not familiar with relays, it's like a little electronic, electromechanical device, little magnet, clicks back and forward. It came into they came into service in 1904. Um, they get taken out every ten years, stripped, cleaned by a team of people in Chippenham, actually not not far from here, who clean them all up, brush the wires, rewind them, send them back out again. Every ten years, there are 
thousands of these things out in service. 30 odd percent of the line is still relay driven. Um, we've never replaced it because it's actually fast, or until 2005, it was faster than computers. That's because these vast parallel, compro parallel processes. We've got this huge amount of legacy, but the data is patchy. Relays don't record any data. That's part of the problem, right? Computers do. We can log that, we can track it, we can do things with it. Relays, not so much. They just kind of sit there and they do the thing that they were meant to do. But we've got the technology to kind of pull this stuff together now. It's starting to come together. If you see on any, any modern mass transit, if you run into London, you go on the underground, any of that system, all the relays are gone. Everything's down. It's now all computer-based and it's driven with something called in-cab signaling, so it's all head-up displays and it's all automated. Driver just presses a button, make sure no one's stuck in the doors, presses a button, it does its own thing. We can do it. We start to do it on mainline. We start doing freight lines. We can pull 1,000 meter long, 2,000 meter long freight trains using this stuff. It's all there. It's just not quite joined up. Uh, if you talk to some of the operators, most people don't necessarily appreciate this. If you're not in rail, I wouldn't expect you to. But the operators who run the railway, they just own the franchise. The actual infrastructure, the trains, all that kind of stuff, that's owned by somebody else and it's leased to them. And then they pay a fee for it. And then they get to make 3% profit. That's all they're capped at, 3%. They don't make huge margins. It's very much a cash business. But the, this, this infrastructure, one of the operators, not far from here, has over 200 IT systems. They don't talk to each other. The earliest of those systems dates back to the 1960s. They have kit from the 70s. They have kit from the 80s. They have kit from the 90s. They have kit that's only just gone in now. And all this stuff is carrying bits of data. And I was sat talking to them a few months back, and they said, actually, we, we, we want to rationalize some of this but we don't know what it does anymore. <laughs> but we, we think if we switch it off, it might knock up that system over there. But we can't prove it, so we're not gonna take the risk. <laughs> there is a huge amount of stuff out there to be fixed. <laughs> we just haven't quite worked out how to do it yet. And they've mapped it, these guys have spent ages, they spent nearly a year mapping this stuff through their network, trying to understand what it did. They still don't know. <laughs> There's still this box in the corner, they dare not switch off. There's a piece of kit that we use for, you actually will have all integrated, you've all used it. If you've done on, on a, uh, your, what are they called, the journey apps, if you're booking your tickets and stuff, there's a system that sits behind that. Uh, one of the systems sits behind that. Rumour has it, and I've not been able to confirm it, but I have on, on, on good authority, it actually sits in someone's basement <coughs> because it was developed as an outsourced product back in maybe the late 90s. And then rail track went bust, and network rail came on board, and then they, it was too expensive to buy it, and so they just left it and kept paying a fee. So it's still sitting in someone's basement. <laughs> now, I can't, prove that, I can't prove that, but having been around the railway for a while now, it does not surprise me. <laughs> this lack of integration is a bit of an issue. That is where all people like yourselves come in. All the startups, all the SMEs, all you experts... You know all this stuff, you do this stuff. The railway, very, very backwards. Transport systems generally are very, very backwards. I, t I talk about railway a lot, partly because of who I am, but if you look at other transport networks, look at road, right? We've got this uh, thing called intelligent transport systems, it's smart, ro smart um, motorways. Smart motorway, you know there's signs that change color and they put little words up and they say, break here, queue ahead. That's the smart motorways bit it's far less smart than what we do on rail. So I, 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 th there's great, there's loads of stuff that can be done there. I talk about rail because that shows you just the scale of the problem. We've tried to do this and we've tried to integrate it, but we're not quite getting it there. This is where you guys come in. The second foundation that we kind of build on though is the idea of command and control because we can start to manipulate the way traffic flows a lot better. And I don't mean manipulate in a malicious way, we can start to control it and, and create the, the variance in flow rate that we need to affect a really efficient system. Because we don't do that a lot. Most of the time, you go around a, if you go around town centres, you'll find most of the colour light signalling, uh, the traffic lights, sorry. Um, it's you know, sensor driven, it's local sensors, it's not based on a sin single central database. The, the strategic road networks, the motorways, that's all centrally controlled. They've got a big centre up in Manchester. They can see what's going on all, all the time. They can start to vary people's journeys by you know, affecting speed limits and that kind of stuff. You can't do that in town centres. But why not? Why aren't we doing it? Why are we not trying to control the flow? It's just a system. But if we can get that transport system to work a little bit more efficiently, we can start to move stuff around more. We can move people. We can move goods. We can start to feed it in and out. And then it becomes a little bit more interesting because we can start to do things like 
get transport to people, to, to people who are um, isolated and living alone. We can start to help people who are a bit less technically literate to kind of do things a little bit more efficiently. We bring them back into the, into the system a little bit more. When you start thinking about how it kind of operates, we've got sustainability environmental impact. We all know that's an issue. And yes, absolutely. But if we can start to do this centrally, we can manage managing flow rates. It means we have less idle time. We have less traffic jams because we can start to control flow and throughput and speed variances. It means we have less, we have greater fuel efficiency, less environmental impact in that sense. We can start to control a lot more of our system uh, based on a, a on a single overall target rather than allowing it to to do what it does. You can get better accessibility. You can bring more people in. You can increase um, access to people with disabilities and, and uh, um, other impairments. We can improve safety. 3,000 people die on the road every year. We can, we can chop that number down if we can start to control it a little bit better. Same thing, optimization. We can start to, to control flow, so we, we increase overall speed. So at the moment, we get a lot of traffic in central cities. It slows right down. You bring that up. We can get that up for maybe 15 mile an hour to 20 mile an hour, 25 mile an hour. We can start to control the speed a little bit more. This is quite noddy. I appreciate that. I didn't expect necessarily to do this. I got two emails. I don't know if anybody else did anybody get two emails that said one that said there was no slide deck allowed. So I kind of I went with the whole it's probably not going to be there, and they've sent the other one out in error. So it was a bit noddy. But if you start pulling everything together, right? So if you can start to grab grab data on throughput. What people's mindset is as well. So you're talking about tickets, you talk paper, electronic tickets, doesn't really matter where it comes from, we can get the data, we can do things with it, we can analyze it, we can understand it. Same thing with freight. What does it actually need? What freight movement do you need to move? What, what's, um, what demand is there to, to address? Uh, what kind of pattern, traffic patterns do we need to start manipulating? What do, you, what do we need to control and affect? Across all transport, you'd have to do it across everything, right? Because ultimately, you can't just run it. It's not just enough to say, I've got the trains coming on time. I've dumped all the people at the station. Oh, there are no taxis. We need to start working on how to do that bit. Uh, at the moment, we don't really do that. We don't think that far ahead. We think, here's our rail network. It comes to here. Here's our road network. It goes to there. Uh, we don't talk to each other. But those two things have got to sit and talk together. Water, air traffic. I was talking to somebody at an um, event a few weeks ago. They're starting to define the framework for how drones fly in, in urban areas. Because people are going to start doing... Transport, right? You start Amazon's gonna start turning up. So how do you control traffic in an urban area? It's different to the national air traffic system because at the moment Nats, you fly stuff is aircraft flying uh, in, like in uh, corridors, air corridors. So Nats, you just get them into a corridor and then it's gone. But if you've got it in a built environment, you're not just you're not flying in corridors. You're flying at maybe a couple hundred meters height. You've got buildings to manipulate around. You've got to try and work work your way around a, a 3D obstacle course, varying heights. Wildly complicated problem. We haven't really thought about that yet. That's not been done elsewhere. But we're starting to have that conversation. But we can do all this in kind of... If we had a single centre, we could put it all together. We could start to manage what we're doing with the air traffic. We can start to move drones into things like traffic traffic monitoring. And hold them, in, hold them in, in standby over traffic and work out what we're doing. You could even have a series of drones sitting there, say, equipped with thermal imaging cameras and, and all this other stuff for, for watching for building fires. Right. That's one of these options that somebody was you know, talked to me about the other day. What happens if we rig these things up with thermal imaging and we start looking for hotspots? If they have a steady state power, we just spiral around the, around the town, watch what's going on. Something comes up, it flags it to the emergency services before the building does, potentially, because it's starting to see, it's, it'll get there before the threshold, it'll look for different thresholds. You get three or four in there, do a circuit of the building, you can identify where people are sitting. There's people over there, there's people here. Fire service arrives, they know exactly to go to floor three, there's five people sitting in that corner. We're not there yet, but think of what the potential is. Think of where you could be going. I guess the reason I came here to talk about this is because none of this is really in the public is in the public sector hands at this point. The public sector is particularly in the UK, there's not been huge amounts of investment in smart cities. Smart cities in the UK tends to be free Wi-Fi. So that's, that's it, generally. Um, there's not an awful lot beyond it. It means that all this stuff is rarely, is not that well, it's not heavily regulated. And I mean that in a sense. It doesn't have a lot of frameworks around it. It doesn't have an awful lot of standardization, which has its 
it's it's a, a con for the long term, but for startups in the, in the short term, you can get the market moving. Uh, you can start to get stuff in place. So there are opportunities all the way through this this life cycle for small companies, small businesses to come in and start doing the thing they do best and start to facilitate some of this. No public funding means private sector funding. Private sector is generally willing to spend money on things that other sectors might not touch. The government has a much higher pain threshold they, they're prepared to, to push back on before they'll, they'll sit and spend money. Private sector won't. Private sector will invest in things preemptively and say, actually, maybe we can go and do interesting stuff. Maybe we can actually try something. Tesla, prime example. Maybe we can go out there and make something of this. Maybe we can generate a whole industry. Public sector, probably a little less so. Look at rail. We're at the point now, uh, we've just got a £53 billion budget infusion. That budget is for maintenance. All we're doing is bringing the system up to the level it should be at. We're not doing anything new. We're not pushing the future. The idea of in-cab signaling and, and automatic trains, that's gone. That's been pushed out for five years because we've got so much obsolete kit out there. £53 billion is just about going to scrape the surface and we're going to bring it up to level. We're not going to do anything really new. East Coast, maybe. East Coast will get a good look. That, that'll be good. HS2, separate budget, 55 billion. Come on. <laughs> we, could, we could think about that. If we doubled that for, for everything else, how far could we get it? HS2, brilliant project. Love it. <laughs> it's a source of love and hate for everybody in the rail industry at the moment. Everybody has worked on it. Everybody hates it. But we've all worked on it, and we all, we all recognise the value of it, but at the same time, it's just a pain in the ass. <laughs> creates all sorts of havoc. We're not doing this stuff now. It's being pushed out. I'm talking to some of the guys on Network Rail, and uh, they, we have uh, future projects teams that look ahead 18 months. Their future projects teams are looking ahead five years, six years, seven years. They're not looking 18 months anymore because they know there's no project money. Maintenance is getting upgrades. There's little stuff happening all over the place. The next real big change is in five years' time. That's five years where no one's looking at this stuff. That's five years where small companies who are a bit more agile and a bit less uh, hindered by network rail necessarily can start to do things, can start to make some groundwork, can start to go out there and start talking to people, talk to your authorities, talk to the local authorities, start to put stuff in motion so that it's ready for five years' time when in our other, other companies and other people start, to, you know, other industries start going, right, now we're going to start, <coughs> we're going to do something. Actually, there's already a whole team of experts who are already doing it and already proven it proven products, proven trials, projects that have worked, and we can all start to, to make that move forward. And it, it, it's necessary, and it is necessary to do that trial step. Um, I've come from, I've been honest, we've tried uh, traffic management in network rail, uh, in rail, which is all basically like air traffic control, but for trains, basically get rid of all your delays. There have been two trials, they both failed. Um, I was on both of them. There was no link. <laughs> but one trial that's going in, it's going quite well. Second, there's a third, fourth trial now that's, that's looking like showing some promise. It's a learning curve. It's a very much a slow burn. Um, five years gets you to that point of being able to go, right, we're now ready to start off properly. We've done our trial, ready to go. Let's kick start it. And that's over to you guys. Other things, but and it's it's broader than just transport. I talk transport because it's what I know and it's the only thing I do. And I'm a railway nut. What can I say? But there's a whole range of other stuff that all sits off the back of it. The renewable energy, the ability to go out and, and actually collect data, actually do something with data, to turn data into information. Please, for the love of God, don't just collect it. We do lots of that in rail. We have data upon data. We have data about data. We have data that goes back to the 1830s. I'm not joking. We actually have records. Very well categorised records, I must say. It's very well stored. But we have archi we have archives of stuff, and we don't do anything with it. I say? When, when I first started railway, the, um, the, I, was, I was amazed. I came from nuclear before. Nuclear, everything was kind of, you've got to build it, just get on and do it. I was, I was fuel side, not power stations. That takes years. Fuel side, much, much quicker. I, I turned around, it was, oh, yeah, it's this little mod. Yeah, it's going to take 18 months to do that. Here are the records. And it turned out, and it's a roll like that. All right. You remember even at school where they teach have the overhead projector and a little piece of acetate. Yeah, this is a roll of acetate, like that, six foot long. And tell me, yeah, that's, that's the design. That's the circuit design for that piece of kit. It was designed in 1925. Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> what am I going to do with this? Oh, we've got to scratch it off and edit it. I'm not doing that. <laughs> can we cad this? Can we cad it? Well, we can try. We can try. That's the acetate stuff. I didn't see it. 
but rumour has it downstairs in our storage, we had silk records. And no no lie, we st there are still records printed on silk. You have to specially edit them, you have to play the, scrape the stuff off, and it's... Oh, it's a painful, painful, slow processing realm. Do something with the data, turn it into information. Don't, don't just store it. Please, for the love of God, we do too much of that already. Data about everything, turn it into information and get it circulated so we can actually start doing something with it. Uh, we're trying that now. Um, we're, Future Ready is trying to get data of all sorts of sources. I'm working on uh, traffic management and other projects and we're making that data uh, and turning it into information a, a real priority for us. We're starting to get some real benefit from it. You guys will see that too. And that really is it, you guys.